He's probably having a little trouble getting out of the house. His wife, Annie, has been giving him a hard time about testifying for me. But you're sure he'll be here? Hank's my best friend. There's no way he'd let Silla accuse me of being a drunk who nearly blew up his own son without helping me set the record straight. This is divorce court presided over by Judge William Keene. In the case we're about to see, Priscilla Vito, an uh, amateur potter, is suing Michael Vito, her husband of 13 years, for divorce on the ground of alcoholism. Michael Vito, a construction worker, is countersuing on the ground of adultery and mental cruelty. They are both seeking sole custody of their 13-year-old son, Paul. Priscilla's testimony has already begun. Mrs. Vito, what caused the breakup of your marriage? In a word, alcohol. I always thought Mike's drinking was limited to a few beers after work, or when he watched football on TV. Then, after 10 years with a man I believe shared everything with me, I discovered Mike was, and always had been, an alcoholic. And what made you believe that? I decided to clear out the old shed behind her house and make it a pottery studio. Hidden under years of junk were about 50 empty bourbon bottles. I knew Mike drank, but not that he was a secret drinker or that his easygoing, laid-back manner came from being half-crocked all the time. We move to strike insufficient foundation. Oh, I'll let the answer stand. You, you may continue. When he got home, I showed him what I found. He looked me straight in the eye and said, Gee, babe, where do you suppose those came from? Then he squeezes my rear and says, Why don't we skip supper and get right to the dessert? Like nothing had happened. And what was your reaction to the attitude he displayed? I went back in the house, gave Paul his supper, and went to sleep in the guest room. Mike kept whispering through the door, Let me in, and I'll give you what I know you want. His whole good old boy philosophy is keep a woman happy under the sheets and she'll uh, keep quiet and let you do what you want. Well, not this woman. Well, what attempts did you make to resolve the situation? I joined a group for people with alcoholic spouses. They said if I didn't get tough, then I'd be an enabler helping him to drink. Well, I told Mike either he stopped and got help or I'd stay in the guest room permanently. He said, honey, all the booze in town's not worth another night without you. I quit. I was so proud of him. And I made sure he knew how proud. And how did you do that? Well, the night after his first session, I sent Polly next door to sleep at Hank and Annie's, cooked Michael's favorite meal, pot roast, and spent all night giving him his fill of his other favorites. A week later, I decided to surprise him by meeting him after a session and taking him to, uh, this is kind of hard to say. Just do the best you can, okay? Most couples are hot for each other at first. But with us, well, every year that fire just grew. We had these places you'd go, we'd go to, you know. They weren't public, but they weren't all that private either. Anyway, I packed a picnic supper. I went to the session, but he wasn't there. He hadn't even shown up the first time. Well, did you manage to locate him? He was at the 10th inning, a sports bar, getting drunk with his buddies, just like always. We, we really had it out, and it wasn't pretty. Mike jumped in his car and took off. I was scared to see him drive in that condition, but if I would have known what was ahead, I'd have laid under the wheels to keep him from leaving. So what did happen that night? Polly was spending the weekend out of friends. Mike went and got him and drove to the construction site. The next thing I knew, a cop was at my door and saying that Mike and Polly were in the hospital. Mike was showing off with explosives and nearly killed my little boy. Hey, that's horse pucky, silly. Right, you know all right, it. All right, Mr. Beto, just be seated. Let's continue. Neither one of them were seriously injured, but I can't, 
Jessica, I won't take a chance on there being a next time. Not with Polly's life at stake. Mike's a drunk, Your Honor. And you have to keep him away from my son. No further questions, Your Honor. Cross-examination. Uh, forgive me for bringing up a painful subject, Mrs. Vito, but wasn't your mother killed by a drunk driver just over a year ago? No. She was murdered by a so-called respectable family man who didn't realize he had one too many. I hope he rots in jail. After her death, didn't you say to Mike, if you so much as eat a liqueur-flavored candy, I'll leave you? No. I said if I ever saw him get in a car when he'd been drinking, well, I'd get the cop on him for his own good. In the three years since buying your home, had you or Mike ever gone through that shed? No. But I did store some stuff in there once, and I'm sure I would have noticed those bottles. So sure you could condemn, even sentence Mike for a crime you had no real proof he'd committed? Those bottles were his. I could see the guilt written all over his face. Wasn't it really your own guilt which was consuming you? No. And weren't you simply looking for something to pin on Mike in order to absolve that guilt? I hadn't done anything to feel guilty about. <sighs> Don't you think sleeping with your ceramics teacher, John Randall, qualifies under that heading? It would if I'd done it. Then just what had you been doing when your husband saw you coming out of Mr. Randall's home at midnight? John was helping me with a pot I was making for Mike's birthday. I wish I'd thrown it at him. You did, several of them. Uh, too bad I missed. All right, all right, that's enough. Nothing further. As divorce court resumes, ceramics instructor John Randall is about to testify on behalf of Silla Vito. Mr. Randall, how did you first meet the Vitos? Well, I first became acquainted with Silla when she enrolled in my class, and with Mr. Vito when he barged in and attempted to remove her from it along with my right arm. At least it felt that way. It still does when it's damp. Did you have any idea of why Mr. Vito was so upset? Only the vaguest. Which is to say, his words were badly slurred, and the ones that I could decipher were X-rated in nature. But the inference was that he seemed to believe that his wife and I were being intimate with each other, which, of course, we were not. Under what circumstances did you next see Mr. Vito? Scylla had been to my home to fire a very complex ceramic glaze. Well, a moment after she left, there was a knock at the door. Naturally, I went and answered it, thinking she'd returned. When a fist with Mr. Vito attached to it narrowly missed my jaw. But he practically fell into the foyer. The stench of alcohol was overpowering. He said, if you go near my wife again, I'll kill you. Then he threw up in my philodendron. Nothing further. Your witness. That same night, didn't you say to Mr. Vito, and I quote, it's hardly surprising your wife chose a man of culture, taste, and breeding, considering the ill-mannered lout she's married to? Not exactly. I said, I should not be surprised if Scylla had made such a choice. I did not indicate I had been so chosen. Even if I had made a sexual proposition, I certainly would never have ended the phrase with a preposition. <laughs> Didn't you ask Scylla to pose nude for a statue you were creating? Oh, yes, several times. But she declined to join in that creative endeavor. But she didn't decline to join you in your bed, did she? I never proffered the invitation. Nothing further. You may step down. Mr. Knight is out to plan his case. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Herring, call your first witness. I call Michael Vito. Much of Michael Vito's construction job involves explosives. Silla Vito claims that her husband in a drunken stupor was trying to impress their son Paul and set off an explosion that could have killed them both. Do. Do you agree with your wife that your marriage fell apart because of your drinking problem? My drinking, what there was of it, was only a problem to Scylla. And only then after her mom was killed. Losing Emma that way grieved both of us. Only it wasn't Scylla's grief that got us into trouble. It was her rage over it being such a senseless thing. You know, I mean, she wouldn't let me have beer in the house. She stopped people in the street and lectured them about liquor. She was losing it all over the place. What did you do to help her through this difficult time? I figured maybe having a hobby would help take her mind off this alcohol thing. So um, she was always dragging me to these arts and crafts shows, so I figured, you know, I'd 
get her a little potter's wheel, a kiln, even 50 pounds of clay, and I paid for her to study with him. Did all of that have a positive effect on her? Yeah, it really did. Except for Paulie and me always finding bits of clay on everything and the house being full of these weird-looking lopsided pots, things got back to normal. But then Scylla decided she needed a studio, found those damn bottles, and all hell broke loose. Had you put those bourbon bottles in the shed, Mr. Vito? So when I was 12, I drank half a bottle of my daddy's whiskey. I got sick as a dog for five days and haven't touched a drop of hard liquor since. And Scylla knew it, yet suddenly uh, I'm this hidden alky. She's sleeping in the guest room, going to these spouses of souses meetings. And That's things not are... funny. Alcoholism right. is a M serious M disease. And... Mrs. Vito, That's enough. Let's continue his hearing. I, I apologize. I know it's a serious problem, but it wasn't mine. My problem had clay under his nails, and he's sitting right there. What made you suspect your wife was having an affair? A one-hour class started taking four hours. She bought a ton of sexy new panties. And last but definitely not least, one night she called me John, just as so she well, had a real bad time. Of course, she denied what I saw with my own eyes the next night. What did she say when you found her at Mr. Randall's home? Nothing. By the time old Randy Randall and I got finished trading punches, she'd split. You don't let that little prissy little act he put on fool you. It was an act. He's got a left that can drop an ox in a mouth that will make my foreman blush. Anyway, I needed some time to think, so I spent that night at Hank's. Will you please tell us what happened the next day, Friday? Yeah, I was pretty torn up. So uh, after work, Hank and I went for a beer. Suddenly, Sill is there telling all the guys how I'm this drunk. She says, if you weren't too drunk to be a real man, you wouldn't have to wonder if I was sleeping with John. She said that in front of everybody. I felt about two feet tall. What did you do then? I went to the one person who always makes me feel like a giant, Paul. You know, he'd been asking to see the old Civic Center before we demolished it, so I took him there. And they were blowing it the next day, and all the charges were laid. So, you know, I walked him around explaining how you set charges to make a building implode. Only a drunken fool would take a little boy now, to... All right, all right, Mrs. Vito. As we were leaving, I went to the men's room. You know, I, I got out, and then boom! The best the inquiry came up with was faulty wiring, but I was completely cleared. Oh God. You know, I may not be perfect, but I'm no drunk, and I'd never put my son in danger or cheat on the person I loved. Nothing further. Cross-examination. Mr. Vito, if, as you claim, you don't touch hard liquor, then how do you explain all those bourbon bottles in your shed? Maybe the old guy we bought the house from liked to have a few. It's, since he passed away a couple of years ago, I guess we'll never know, right? A few days after your wife found those orphan bottles, did you not break down and admit that you had a drinking problem? I wouldn't say I broke down exactly. It was more like I Mr. Felt Vito, did you or did you not admit that you were, in fact, an alcoholic? Yeah, yeah, I guess I did. An admitted alcoholic, yet you don't have a drinking problem. Do you care to tell the court what you mean by that? Look, Scylla said she wasn't moving back to our bedroom till I admitted to being an alcoholic. So I admitted it, but it wasn't true. Do you really expect this court to believe that you lied to your wife about something as, as deadly serious as that? I don't know what was in Scylla's mind or why she was obsessed with the idea of saving me, but she was. Look, I loved her. I wanted to make her happy, and I didn't see any other way of doing that. If you loved your wife so much, then why didn't you believe her when she denied that she was committing adultery? Hey, I offered to forgive her, didn't I, and take her back? I didn't do anything to be forgiven for. All right, all right, that's enough from both of you. Now, let's continue. No further questions, Your Honor. All right, you may step down. Ms. Herring, before you call your next witness, I'm going to recess, and I want to talk to uh, Paul Vito. Is that agreeable? That's fine with us. All right, we'll be in recess for that purpose. <laughs> We return to divorce court. Judge Keene is about to talk with 13-year-old Paul Vito. Hello, Paul. I'm Judge Keene. Yeah. Well, what am I supposed to do now? Applaud? No, I don't want you to applaud, but would you mind sitting down and talking to me just a couple minutes? Okay. Now what? Well, let's start with you telling me uh, how you feel about your what's happening to your parents. How do you think? I don't know why my folks split up. Paul, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's only one side in here, and we're both on it. I'm not your enemy. I didn't say you were. Well, all this anger you're showing me, is that because your parents aren't living together anymore? Are you kidding? 
Them splitting up is the best thing that ever happened to me. I, I don't understand that. Hey, wait up a minute. Now that they're both not together, they both want to be with me. You mean they didn't want that before? No. They kept dumping me at Hank and Annie's house or sending me to sleep with a friend and pretending like it was because I'd have more fun somewhere else. I'm not some dumb kid who doesn't know why they don't want me around. Did they ever say that to you? No, they didn't have to. They were always arguing or else they were always whispering and kissing and sneaking upstairs. They couldn't have cared less about me. Paul, I know that's not true. Both of your parents, both of your parents love you very much. Yeah, now they love me. Now they notice me. I'm important. Now? Paul, is, is that why you set off that explosion to call attention to yourself? It was just, it was a shot in the dark when it hit the target. You've got a very troubled son on your hands, and he is, he's come to believe recently that the two of you love each other so much that there's nothing left over for him. I don't understand. You both adore Paul. He's always been the most important thing in our life. You may feel that way, but you, you haven't shown it to him. Mrs. Nino, you know, there's been a lot of turmoil in your life since the tragic death of your mother. And Paul must feel that. Well, what do we do now? It's not too late, is it? I don't think when there's love, it's, it's ever too late. And the fact that you have agreed to postpone this action and seek counseling is, is proof of that. Now, that counseling has got to include Paul. And if you will do that, I think the three of you have a very good chance of putting your family back together again and putting your lives back together again. Uh, you know, I only want what's best for Paul. What's best for all of us? We return to divorce court. Judge Keene has spoken with 13-year-old Paul Vito, then with Mr. and Mrs. Vito in chambers. He's now ready with his closing remarks. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Vito, as we discussed in chambers, it's, it's important for you to realize that by postponing this action here today, that's not the solution to the problem. That's just the first step on a long, long road to seeing if you can't put your lives back together again. The untimely passing of your mother, Mrs. Vito, I think uh, perhaps was the catalyst that brought these problems to a head, but they were there all along and they were just ready to surface. Now, Mrs. Vito, as I, as I listened to your testimony, I, I had the feeling that I was listening to a very young girl uh, talking about her first serious romance. You know, people can make love uh, long before they are ready or mature enough to understand the nature of love and true commitment. You know, you said that your passions for each other just seem to grow over the years. Well, it seems to me that in concentrating upon that aspect of your relationship, uh, you not only set out or shut out your son uh, from your love, but your lives as well. You not only did that, but you didn't allow your love to grow and, and flourish in, in the other areas. And then when serious situations did develop, you had no place to go, except to those areas which always damage marriages, which was mistrust and suspicion and lack of communication. Now, the counseling sessions that you have agreed to undertake uh, with Paul is, I think, the only hope that you have of putting your family back together again, putting your lives back together again, and, and, and reaching a, a level that is going to be much more rewarding for all three of you. And you have my best wishes as you attempt to do that. Let me give you one final, one final piece of advice, and that is that the privacy and the peace of the marital bed is a wonderful place, it's a wonderful place to communicate with words. This court stands in recess.
Hotel accommodations for the divorce court staff have been provided by Travel Lodge Hotel at the Walt Disney World Village.